After about three years and around 80 plus sessions of DMing my online Icewind Dale Rime of the Frost Maiden campaign, it has finally come to an end. I can safely say that it was one of the greatest role-playing experiences of my life, but it was also a huge learning experience. I tested out a lot of new ideas and tried a lot of things, and some I'd likely never do again, but there is some stuff I tried that I can't imagine running a campaign without. Let's alternate between the good and the bad and get into it. By the way, if you like this kind of content, you want to see more, please, I'd consider liking and subscribing. I know, <laughs> I know you always hear it, but it goes a long way. Appreciate it. The good, survival rules that worked. This game was heavily focused on cold weather survival, keeping warm, finding and preserving food, managing inventory and weight. They were all top focuses for what we were doing in this campaign. So here's some of the rules that worked. Travel rules. I tried to flesh out a travel system with some mixed success. An activity system is where I landed, where each player chooses an activity to do while traveling, i.e. scouting, navigating, foraging, scavenging, and giving bonuses to other players' roles with the help action and bardic inspiration. Another system was weather, just adding weather conditions like blizzards. They added a lot both to travel and combat encounters. I strongly encourage you use them, it's pretty sick. My party had a lot of go-to strategies, but doing them in a blizzard really keeps them on their toes. They've got to think of new ways to handle situations. Eventually, as the party gained levels and all developed cold resistance, cold weather survival got thrown out the window. But that actually wasn't a problem. Overcoming things that in the early game would have been huge obstacles is a big part of the power fantasy. Another thing I did that I liked was encumbrance. This is really important as an aspect of survival as it determines how much you can bring with you to adventures and how much you can take back. Firewood, rations, dungeoneering supplies, animal feed, all of it's important and makes your players want to work hard to get adventure support in the form of hirelings and pack animals and friends and trade, trade routes. All of it's good, it's all gold. The more you can do to encourage your players to engage with the world, the better. The bad. Survival rules that didn't work. Containers. Things like how much can a backpack hold or what do you strap on the outside, that sort of thing. It's too nitty gritty, people just didn't do it. And I was too busy with other aspects of the game to care. And it just, it didn't really affect gameplay at all. I, I would recommend just sticking with carrying capacity. It's really all you need to achieve the realism aspect that you're trying to do with the survival rules. Another one was donning and doffing armor for camp. I tried to implement a system for this where sleeping in armor could give you exhaustion and putting it on takes time. I ended up just throwing the system out. My players didn't love it and yeah, it's more realistic, but it wasn't really helping the fun. It just added more upkeep, so I tossed it. You might have more luck with this, but I didn't. Another one was travel pace. Some things that didn't work with travel roles was a mapping activity that never got used and also deciding travel pace. Essentially, I just used mounted versus unmounted movement and on-road versus off-road to determine how fast the party was moving. There was only really one section in the game where pace truly mattered, and I'll get to that shortly, but essentially, I wouldn't worry about a pace mechanic and instead just make like a racing thing, more like a skill challenge where the party needs to get somewhere in a hurry, so they've all gotta add something to speed up the, the group and risk exhaustion, that sort of thing. Just more play it into the story rather than having a fleshed out mechanic, because to me, it just didn't work. The good, this one's gonna maybe ruffle some feathers, but banning stuff at the start of the game works. Because of the survival focus of my game, I made some targeted bans that would remove the fun and challenge from this integral pillar of the experience. This included spells like Goodberry, Magical Mansion, Tensor Floating Disc, the entire Artificer class. All of these things trivialize the survival aspect of the game, and that's the game I was pitching, so they had to go. I actually ended up allowing artificers once my players hit a certain level and the technology of the world was advancing since they had reached a point where artificer wouldn't make the game unfun anymore. So then that was unbanned essentially. It's really important to have your ban list up front and center when you are pitching a game so that if it's a deal breaker for anyone, you both know right away. If a player is not interested in, in engaging with the survival aspect of this game, then they're super not going to enjoy the game I'm planning to run. So it's Best that you get that sorted first thing. The bad. Wizards of the Coast does not playtest some of their mechanics well enough. I am going to give you a slight spoiler to Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, so if you don't want to hear that, go to this timestamp. 
At a certain point in the game, your players are going to go to the mountains to face off against a Dwergar overlord. But just as they get to his mountain fortress, a big old dragon bursts out of it and flies off to attack the main towns of the game. Rules is written, given both the distance from the mountain and the max possible pace the players can move, there is no chance to arrive before the dragon has destroyed 90% of the towns. But the book makes it seem like you can head the dragon off if you go there right away. There's some complicated math, but essentially the whole chapter of the book is borked. There's some good supplements online that help fix this specific quest. Um, I used those actually when I was running it. I might even link these in the description if I can uh, find what I used. But the fact is those should be optional. And I, I would argue that if you're running this, it's not optional. You need some uh, outside supplement to even make that chapter runnable. Running it rules as written is just broken. It's not what the designers intended. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they intended the you to go up the mountain and then have no chance of saving the plurality of the towns in Icewind Dale. That doesn't make any sense. It's completely messed up and needed fixing before the book was released. Um, so essentially you get blindsided by this enemy you didn't know was coming and you lose everything without having any real chance to stop it. Rime of the Frostmaiden is one of my favorite D&D adventure books, but it's stuff like this that makes you realize Wizards of the Coast is really terrible at thinking through new mechanics. Stuff like travel is obviously an afterthought for them. I have more complaints about D&D adventures, but that's gonna be another video. I'm not gonna get into it too deeply here, but that was one of the bad things. The good, tracking time. This was the single most impactful thing I did for my game. I cannot understate how much this helped. It gave context to how long my players had been adventuring and gave weight to their time together. It allowed me to set dates for specific events in the future, which meant my players needed to plan their adventure around those events, which meant travel and rests became important tools. It even let my players have in-game birthdays, which led to some wonderful role-playing moments where characters could exchange meaningful gifts, it truly was a ripple effect that had so many positive effects on the game, and now I will never run a game that does not track date and time. I really can't imagine not having that tool at my disposal ever again. The bad, the kingdom and warfare mechanics. At a certain point in the game, the players formed a kingdom. I attempted to use Matthew Colville's Kingdoms and Warfare book to accommodate this new pillar of gameplay to mixed, but mostly bad results. The thing about adding a pillar to your gameplay in the middle of the game is it isn't the game your players signed up to play. It's like if you showed up for a game of Yahtzee and someone pulls out a risk board and they're like, it's the same, they both use excited die. It's it's not the same, they're completely different. The Kingdoms and Warfare rules aren't bad, don't get me wrong, but they're just heavy. And I might get people in the comments saying, no, they're very simple, they're perfectly simple. If you just read the book, listen, my players don't want to read the book. They already know how to play D&D and they wanted to play D&D. They don't know how to run a kingdom or play a war game. And most important, at least one person around the table really didn't like the whole mechanic of it. So it, as a group, it made it not a fun thing. Before I even tried to bring these rules in, I did ask permission first, pitching it as an experiment, which it very much was. And sometimes when you experiment, you don't get the results you were hoping for. What I will say for this part of the game is even though I do view it as a mistake, it did make the kingdom feel like a part of the world and my players had fun with it for at least a little bit and making personal units for themselves and all that sort of stuff helped the kingdom feel grounded and personal, but it came at the cost of grinding the game to a halt and playing a very different game that no one had really signed up for. So after this kingdom arc I ran, I relegated all of that kingdom stuff to the background where it really belonged in that campaign, which brought us back to delving into dungeons, which we did for the remainder of the campaign. So let's get back. To the good, going off book and making my own dungeons. One of the things I found frustrating in this adventure book is that until the very end, all of the dungeons are just small little cave networks that don't take more than a single adventuring day to get through. Most of the dungeons don't even require a short rest to get through. It really isn't until the end of the book that you actually get a dungeon in the Dungeons and Dragons game. So like I did many times in this adventure, I went off book. I picked one of the roaming enemies in the book, the ice dragon Arbeatris, and fleshed out her story into a massive dungeon. I was even able to rehome some content that got skipped in earlier parts of the book and add it in as subsections of this new larger dungeon. Doing this felt like a breath of fresh air to me. I've been running D&D adventures for a long time now, 
But I started with homebrew, and doing this reminded me of how much I missed it. Don't get me wrong, I love running adventures. It's easier to run a pickup game when someone's done all the work for you, and often there are some really good ideas inside. But sometimes it feels like taking an open book test that you didn't study that hard for and that the writers of the textbook sometimes don't know the answers to? When I make my own world, all the answers are in my head and my notes, so I rarely feel surprised at what my players find and explore. I've got it all upstairs, and I feel comfortable making it up on the spot. Doing that in a pre-written adventure, I feel worried I might be breaking some sort of canon for later in the story. Running this dungeon helped me decide that my next campaign is going to be homebrew, and I am very excited to run it. The bad. I needed a better plan to integrate backstories faster. Integrating backstories into your campaign is the quickest way to level up your DMing, and it's something I knew well ahead of this campaign. My issue was I had certain players who had backstories with origins miles, hundreds of miles away from where the campaign was taking place. So my thought on handling this was I'll just do their backstory last since it'll take a while from anyone who shows up from their backstory to travel from there to here. Now this makes sense on a surface level, but it's not something I would do again the reason is, even if you have some cool plan for a character's backstory coming into play, you don't want to wait 30 sessions, which could translate into months or even years of play to get to it. They're not going to wait that long. They're going to get frustrated thinking that you're just ignoring them in the campaign. In my next campaign, backstories are going to all be featured in session one. In session one, that's the cheat code. They're not going to be done by then, but they're going to be touched upon in the first session all of them. And that's going to be the primary motivator for the story going forward. That's the big takeaway I got here is don't be don't be coy. Don't be like, oh, I've got something for you. Just you wait a year uh, in your head. You know, you have something and it's it's so cool. It's just it's sick. But <laughs> I, I you're just going to lose get people to lose interest in your game if you do that. So that's the lesson. Shove it in there. Get in, <laughs> get it done. I watched a really good tutorial on building a plot web from the channel Enter the Dungeon, which I think I'm actually going to use for planning my new campaign. I'll link that below. It's it's an excellent video. It's it's kind of like a live stream of how he uh, integrates all of the different backstories to drive the plot. I think it's a really smart way to do it. So check that out below. The good making resources for my players to use that make it easier for them to track the world. One of my major innovations was an NPC tracker. I put every NPC in my game into a public document, sorted it by location or faction, and it wasn't just helpful for my players, it was invaluable as a resource to myself, because I would often look through it and find useful story hooks from earlier adventures based on NPCs that they've met, or things that were going down, or how stories for certain NPCs might be developing while they've been gone. Other resources that can be helpful are calendars, maps, religion and culture breakdowns, inventory sheets using like Google Sheets, like a, through Google Drive, something that everyone has access to for a shared inventory. All that stuff, all those player raids, use them. They're super helpful. They help drive engagement in your world. Instead of doing one more bad one, let's end with one last good one. Epilogues. Completing a campaign is a rare and beautiful thing, but ending it with an epilogue, seeing the impact your characters had on the world and telling us their story as the credits are rolling. Sublime! I gave everyone carte blanche to basically take the next 10 years of this world and do whatever they wanted to with their characters. Um, I said 10 years rather than even going further because there's a chance we run this back as like a shorter f sequel campaign, kind of using what happened in the world as a springboard. But for those 10 years, I just told them, tell me what happens. What does your character do? And then as they gave their epilogue, they played their theme music, their, this music they chose uh, for uh, their character and it was peak. It was so great. And then f after they were all done, um, I gave like a sweeping narration, uh, going over the world 10 years after, uh, they'd finished their adventure, going over all like the different towns and characters that they'd met and all the things they'd changed and how the world was like a better place and a different place. Um, and sometimes some small area is a worse place, but mostly oh, it's a better place. Um, and it was amazing. As we listened to every player narrate their ending, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. 
truly peak D&D. What a fucking game. What a fucking game. Finishing this campaign has been gassed up in a major way. There were good moments, there were, there were bad moments, but I think after all the lessons along the way, the major thing, the major thing that will stick with me is how wonderful it was to experience this story and share it with my friends. And I want everyone to experience that. I know it's not easy to finish a campaign if it's not drama or burnout that breaks up a campaign. It's scheduling conflicts, which is the true BBEG of D&D. <laughs> but finishing a game really gives it a whole different meaning. If completing long form campaigns seems out of reach for you, maybe one shots or shorter campaigns are the answer to getting that complete story. I'm definitely gonna be trying some out alongside my new homebrew campaign. Some of the top ones on the list are Monster Hearts, Blades in the Dark, and Cyberpunk Red. And once I play these, uh, I'll come back with a report and let you know what I think. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Ben DeHart, and I had the time of my life fighting dragons with you. See ya.